So one of the most common questions I get asked is, why don't you talk about Christianity? Well, I do sometimes, but you see, the thing is, I was never a Christian, I'm not a Christian, and I don't know the Bible. I don't think it's fair for someone who doesn't know a religious tradition to just pick up a book, start reading it, and make judgments on it. I think sometimes people make mistakes when they do the same thing with the Quran because they're not coming from that context, they're not coming from that background. Nevertheless, I did attempt this conversation with Dr. Uros. It didn't go so well for me because I didn't know the Bible and of course he has a much better science background than me. However, what it did appear to me is that Dr. Ross was reinterpreting the Bible in order to make it seem to fit with science. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share some clips of Dr. Ross speaking with Ken Ham, who is known for reading the Bible in a very straightforward, literal way. They had a discussion and I found it quite interesting. I want to share some clips from this conversation and I'm going to add my comments. But you know, the Bible says the earth came before the sun. The earth was covered with water. Where? Which is Does opposite what that? you... Oh, just read, read Genesis here. Yeah, okay. but you, you got the point of view wrong there, Ken. It says that the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And if you read Job 38 and 39, which parallels the six creation days well, of Genesis 1... Well, Job 38 and 39 is not the counter creation. It's uh, Genesis 1 to 11 is the counter creation. Yeah. Job 38 and 39 is not. Excuse me. Job 38 and 39 <laughs> is a text from God about what he did in creation. It actually reviews it's, all it's six creation days. It's certainly telling things about creation, that's true, but it's not a chronological creation account. I didn't say it was a chronological so, account. Uh, what I, well, this Genesis is awesome, is. by the <laughs> way. I mean, <laughs> I'm just telling okay, keep, keep going, keep going, keep going. Well, okay, I think this is making a good point. It's yeah. not enough to take the Bible literally. We need to take it literally and consistently which means we need to look at all the creation texts in the Bible. So, for example, when I read the Bible for the first time at age 17, I saw Genesis 1 there. I saw that it followed the scientific method, which I later found out was taken from the Bible. So, of course, it followed the scientific method. Mm -hmm. But I also note, as I went on in the Bible, there were three texts in the Bible that paralleled the six creation days. Proverbs 8, Job 38 and 39, and Psalm 104. And those three texts actually give you more scientific detail than you get in Genesis 1. Wow. But putting them all together, it makes it easy to come up with a consistent interpretation of what the Bible is telling us about creation. And what brought me to faith in Christ, it's a perfect fit with God's book of actually, nature. Actually, Genesis 1 to 11 is historical narrative. You know, the Psalms are, sure. are poetry, as you know. And in the New Testament, New Testament writers quote from Genesis to build all their doctrines because every single biblical doctrine of theology is founded in Genesis 1 to 11. You can't believe Genesis 1 to 11 is written. You have no foundation for the rest of the Bible. So, we have two different books, the book of Genesis and the book of Job. Both are attributed to Moses, a figure who probably didn't exist, but modern scholars increasingly see the book of Genesis as a product of the 6th and 5th centuries BC. The book of Job, scholars generally agree it was written between the 7th and 4th century BCE, with the 6th century BCE as the most likely period for various reasons. So we have two different books written completely different times by anonymous authors, probably different people. Genesis on its own falls completely apart in regard to science. The only way to save it is to reinterpret it according to the other books, such as the book of Job. A straightforward reading completely falls apart. Let's review what creation.com says. There are major contradictions between a straightforward reading of scripture and the order claimed by uniformitarian slash evolutionary science. The above should show why it's futile to try to expand the timescale of Genesis, the order of events is also diametrically opposed to the long age order. They also have this graph, this nice graph they created that shows the biblical days and the order of creation according to the Bible and what Big Bang and evolution, basically science, tells us the order is. Now the interesting thing is the biblical order is based on what? What somebody wrote. The other order is based on 
evidence, is based on actual science, is based on fossils, is based on the fossil record. It's based on things we can observe and measure and collect, right? So that's the big difference. You're, you're going on trust versus going on, you know, foundation of science that's being built up over the years, right? And obviously, which one is superior? It, it should be clear, right? Um, response to, to John, what he said over here, and my, my point is this, that I think we need to uh, really understand here, and that is, we would agree that you, you can't have disagreement on the resurrection, mm -hmm. the virgin birth, mm -hmm. Israelites crossing the Red Sea is a miracle, mm -hmm. a fish swallowing Jonah for three days, mm -hmm. but yet we're saying it's okay to disagree on what Genesis plainly says. And, and the point, that I want, point I want to make here, I want to make two points. One is, John said something about baptism, right? Okay. And, he, you know, there are different views of baptism, and there are some different views of eschatology, pre-mill, post-mill, R-mill, windmill, whatever. <laughs> uh, <there's> different <laughs> views of eschatology, yeah. right? Gotcha. But if we're really honest, the, the bottom line, in, in, in an ultimate sense, mostly, when people are disagreeing on those things, they're arguing from Scripture, it could be their view of Israel, their view of the church, their view of Daniel, their view of Ezekiel, whatever, or their view of, of circumcision and, 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 and baptism, and, and, and so it goes on. But the reason there's disagreement on Genesis is not, we're not really arguing about what's here. We're really saying we, we've got to have the Big Bang and the billions of years and so on. We've got to somehow fit that into Scripture. It's really taking outside ideas to add into Scripture. And, and the other point I want to make is that we talk about the book of nature, but you see, we're fallible human beings, and Scripture says we're fallen. And obviously when you're taking the Bible, you, you, you have an interpretive method. I take the grammatical, historical, interpretive method. I, I take it at face value. If it's history, it's history. If it's poetry, it's poetry. I understand that. But you see, taking this book as written, I know that the ground is cursed. Hmm. Uh, the whole of creation groans in pain. It's a fallen world. Hmm. And I'm a fallen being. So m looking at a fallen creation and trying to interpret that, well, my, through my eyes, I can't trust that. I look through the written revelation from God and I let it speak to me in the best of my ability. And I'm not saying we can do this 100%, obviously, but to the best of my ability, I want God, this is His Word. See, when we say, what was Moses trying to say? or what was Mo See, I don't look at it that way. I look at it, as Paul said in Thessalonians, this is in truth the Word of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's, if this is the Word of God, I let God speak to me in the best of my ability to not try to impose my ideas on Scripture. I let it speak to me. And one practical example, we would never say that um, God says brain tumors or cancer are very good, right? Correct. But if you believe in millions of years, Dr. Ross believes fossil records millions of years old, in the fossil record, supposedly millions of years before man, there's evidence of brain tumors, cancer, thorns. The Bible says thorns came after the curse. See, what I'm saying is on the basis of the authority of Scripture, that fossil record has to come after sin and because it's a fallen world. And so that's how I work. That's how I work. So he takes the Bible before observations about reality. This is a perfectly rational thing to do if you believe you have a book from the creator of the universe, a book that was inspired by the Holy Spirit and came through the words of men. However, what Dr. Ross is trying to do is trying to make the two fit together. What I, what I have to say is if this book was really from God, if these writings, if these statements were inspired by God, we would expect to see something totally different. We would expect to see that observable reality match the words inspired by God. What Ken Ham is saying makes a lot of sense. It's coherent. Christians don't question the virgin birth or Jonah going in the belly of a whale or any other miraculous event, but they attempt to reinterpret Genesis. Why are they doing this? Because there's an obvious problem here. This reminds me of the same thing that Muslim apologists do, such as Harun Yahya, or there is no clash. Let's try to make the Quran fit science by reinterpreting all the words to make them mean something totally different. Let's review Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Where did this idea come from? We find this in Islam as well, surprisingly. 
And it is he who created the heavens and the earth in six days, and his throne had been on the water. Quran 11.7 This is actually a recurring motif in many ancient religions. Prime evil waters is also called cosmic ocean. Wikipedia states, a cosmic ocean or celestial river is a mythological motif found in the mythology of many cultures and civilizations, representing the world or cosmos as enveloped by primordial waters. In creation myths, the primordial waters are often represented as originally having filled the entire universe, being the first source of the god's cosmos with the act of creation corresponding to the establishment of an inhabitable space separate from the enveloping waters. Because I always used to wonder, even as a Muslim, why was God thrown on water? How does that make sense? How is that like, like how does that work? Like water? <laughs> like, like, you know what I mean? We have this emptiness of space, but somehow God is above water, Allah, right? Why all this talk about water, you might wonder? It's something I used to wonder too. Here's one possibility to ponder. Imagine yourself in an ancient society. One of the most stable and vast realities is that of the ocean. It seems to go on forever. They probably thought that the sea existed for all eternity. This is why we find that many ancient creation mythologies go back to this motif of this ocean or this water. Continuing with Genesis 1. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. So let's review. God created the heavens and the earth, the universe. Earth was formless and empty. Then he created light, and he called it night and day. Does this sound like an accurate depiction of cosmology or a children's tale? How does God create light? He created the photons after he created the earth? As Ken Ham says, a straightforward reading would indicate that the earth came before the sun, according to the Bible. But you know, the Bible says the earth came before the sun. The earth was covered with water. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to say God created light after he created the earth and then made night and day. Yes, an ancient person might have thought, you know, night and day, there's the earth, God made night and day. But, but what is night and day? And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky. And there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. Okay, hold up there. Here's another problem. What's this water in the sky? Is he talking about clouds? Put yourself again in the shoes of an ancient man or woman who didn't know about the water cycle. You see water coming in torrents from the sky above. What would you think? There must be an ocean in the sky. And God must have separated the two oceans, right? The ocean in the sky from the ocean on earth. Makes perfect sense. To a four-year-old <laughs> or a pre-modern man. Genesis 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the night from the day. And let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. Do you know what this reminds me of? They ask you about the new moons. Say, they are measurements of time for the people and for Hajj. Chapter 2, verse 189 of the Quran. It is he who made the sun a shining light and the moon a derived light and determined for it phases, that you may know the number of years and account of time. So the Quran is saying almost the same thing as the Bible here. It's, it's not just a narcissistic way of looking at the world, but everything is made for us puny mortals. It's also a very practical perspective. We can use the celestial objects to measure time and to mark sacred months. So that's what they're made for. It must be. Genesis 15. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. So the stars are to give us light at night. These ancient balls of gas and dust that have been around for far, far, far longer than we have are simply for us to have light. Genesis 16, 
God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. The two great lights, the sun and the moon. Where have I heard this before? That's right, in the Quran, in the verse I just quoted, he made the sun a shining thing and the moon as a light, right? Chapter 10, verse 5. It's interesting that they describe the sun and the moon as lights. We all know the sun is a source of light, but the moon is actually a reflected light. Not only did these ancient scriptures not know that the moon is not a source of light, they did not know that the moon was a reflected light, except for the modern translators who are translating Nur in the Quran as a reflected light, whereas Nur has nothing to do with reflection because Allah himself is called An-Nur. So what is he? The reflected light? <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. Let me tell you a secret. All of these ancient scriptures forgot to mention something very interesting about the moon. Where did the moon come from? Did God just make it and plop it in the sky? Let me share you a secret. When astronomers went to the moon, they took some dirt back with them and they were amazed to find out, guess what? The moon used to be part of the earth. It was blasted off by an ancient collision that impacted the earth. The fact that none of the ancient scriptures mention this is not surprising at all. Not at all, because it was written thousands of, thousands of years ago. An educated teenager today could write a better creation account than the biblical or Quranic one. We can see that modern cosmology or science in general and the Bible don't go together. A child living today could explain cosmology and the, and the creation of the universe far better than the Bible or the Quran could. Both get it terribly wrong. Thanks for watching. I uh, hope you enjoyed this and I hope you learned something. I, I learned quite a bit. Uh, if you have any comments on, let me guess, I, how I interpreted the Bible totally wrong, let me know. Um, I hope that this straightforward, you know, a straightforward reading, I think, shows quite clearly that it's completely off the mark. Um, and if you can please afford to support me on Patreon, I would greatly appreciate it or send a one-time donation at PayPal. Thank you so much. This is Abdullah Samir signing out.